To this point, what should be emerging is how much any organization cares about its social responsibility will depend on what it values. Therefore, our objective in this podcast is to explore the implications of values on corporate social responsibility. And we begin with the Greeks. Why begin with the Greeks? Because the history of the notion of values can be traced back to debates that ancient Greeks had over 2,500 years ago when ethics was established as a form of philosophical inquiry. The best-known philosophers, such as Plato and Aristotle, are the main founders of the concept of values as we know them in a modern age. Plato argued for the primacy of objective values, that there is such a thing that we can define as truth, as good, as beauty. And these can be divided into instrumental values, i.e. the means to achieve an end, mixed values that address means and an end, and intrinsic values, the ends themselves. Aristotelian ethics is a bit different. It's known as virtue ethics, and it's concerned with the evaluation of the qualities of character or the virtues of character that make a community member fit in and function at a higher level within some social fabric. So Aristotelian ethics really provides a basis for the developmental of ethical values as we know them today, particularly applicable to social responsibility. But while the Greeks may have debated virtue and values, in a modern context, this typically comes to three questions. First, what's the most important thing to us personally, or as an organization, organizationally? Second, what's appreciated by others? And third, is there a right way to behave regardless of anything else? These questions, in and of themselves, most often aren't that hard to answer, but there's no real single way to define what values are, what they aren't. So there's no universal definition of the concept of values, and even though it has its roots in moral philosophy and social psychology, it produces a lot of definitions and measurements for values. In sociology, for example, values are regarded as a social phenomena and factors that explain human actions, so they can be categories at various levels such as individual, institutional, national, and so on. And they can be justified by understanding cultural, philosophy, religious, and customs. So, for example, individual values can be thought of as the way that we internalize social life our, or our moral beliefs that appeal to us as a rationale for our actions. So, individual values mean that we self-regulate because we are social animals and we want to achieve social goals. But groups can develop values in the same way. So group values are viewed as scripts or cultural ideals held in common by members of a group as a means to understanding the group's social mind. So different groups have different value priorities, and that can influence their perception of reality or even motivations for action. But when we boil this all down is that there are really just a number of ways for figuring out what's important to people, to our communities, to our organizations. And a lot of the different sources or determinants of values range from religions to cultural values and even the organizations that we work for. So this is why we constantly debate what our real values are. Now, at an organizational level, it's actually not too hard to define values. Most organizations at least have an explicit statement of what they value. Now, whether they follow this is a debate for another day. But organizations tend to codify their values in written form. So this isn't the case for individual and social level values, because these are usually unwritten and codified across time and experience. So. If all of this is, is the case, that it's all very fuzzy and nebulous, how can we understand values if potentially each and every person could have a slightly different set of values? At some point, it seems impossible to have a good discussion. From a practical or strategic standpoint, it can also be hard to evaluate what an organization should do in order to be socially responsible if we can't even nail down and evaluate values. However, there are theoretical frameworks. In this case, Schwartz's theory of values categorizes values across different categories. 
This categorization comes from empirical tests across 20 different countries, so it's actually quite a robust and useful categorization. Let's take a look at these different categories. First, universalism. To what extent does our understanding and appreciation and tolerance for people and welfare all connect? Do we see all of this is somehow inherently combined? Second, benevolence. This is the degree to which the preservation and the enhancement of the welfare of people and the folks that we interact with uh, is something that is valuable. Third, conformity and tradition. Conformity and tradition focus on the respect, commitment, and acceptance of customs or ideas that traditional culture or religion provides as a way of restraining action, that are the degree to which we wish to restrain our actions to conform, to be in line with tradition, is some, some kind of value in and of itself. Next, security, representing the value that we place on safety, harmony and stability within our social relationships or even on our own. Next, power. To value power asks about the social status and prestige in control or dominance over people and resources. Achievement now as we start to shift, achievement becomes a much more individual level value emphasizing the personal success through demonstrating competence according to some sort of social standard. Hedonism, the pleasure or the sensuous gratification for oneself, is that something we genuinely value? Stimulation, is it about excitement, novelty, challenge, being an adrenaline junkie, for example? Self-direction, the independent thought or of action or creation. How do we choose or create or explore? Now, these categories of values range from those that are very focused on society and society's well-being to the individual and the individual's well-being. But also, as you can see, when you look around the circle, they're talking about four broader themes. Self-enhancement, which is based on the pursuit of personal status and success, in opposition to self-transcendence, which is a general concern with the well-being of others, then you also contrast openness to change, which is centered on independence and readiness, as opposed to conservation values that are not related to environmental or nature conservation, but self-restriction and the preservation of the past, a resistance to change. So much of the ongoing research on values simply supports some con common sense, intuitive ideas. Some values or m motivations are likely to be associated, others less so. So when we're concerned for the other's welfare, we are very unlikely to be strongly interested in our own status or financial success, and vice versa. When we're at our most hedonistic or thrill-seeking, we're unlikely to simultaneously be strongly motivated by respect or tradition. But it also reveals that these relationships are not unique to our culture or society. They seem to recur with remarkable consistency all over the world, though the value placed in these relative uh, tensions, that's what changes. So Schwartz argues that by understanding values, we can understand how they affect people, and he articulates five features of values. Let's take a look at these, because if we're going to understand how values are developed and how values influence people's behavior, then it's begin to, we must begin to critically understand how to determine what we as individuals and organizations should do if we want to be viewed as socially responsible within any cultural context. So first, by understanding emotions and how people react, we can get a better understanding of what it is that people value. Second, values motivate people to act in different ways. One way to understand values, therefore, is to observe how organizations and people behave. We can begin to understand what they value by observing the behaviors. Third, 
Values are inherently connected to our goals, even if they are our broad social goals. So if we think about goals as being both intrinsic and extrinsic, then we can also begin to understand and predict behaviors about what's expected. Examples of intrinsic values are those that make us feel good, but don't necessarily give us direct reward. So we would include maybe our personal connections. As social animals, we typically seek identification with friends and family. We have empathy towards those that we know and encounter. Um, a lot of times we like a sense of fairness. We like to express ourselves. Examples of extrinsic values are those that that tend to be reward-based, that we're rewarded for particular behaviors. So this would include things like material success, image, prestige, and power. People and organizations can be more or less intrinsically or extrinsically motivated, but there's often a combination of these motivations that drives our goals and our objectives. Fourth, values, once they become codified in some way, become evaluative criteria for actions, policies, people's behaviors, and events. So this can be through laws, but it can also be at an individual or informal level as well. We can therefore measure how people judge the actions of others based on their approval or disapproval of particular actions. Of course, we can measure in a lot of different ways. In an organizational context, for example, this can connect to eva evaluations of reputation and trustworthiness. Finally, when we understand a group's values, we can see it as a system that can not only be used to describe and assess people and culture at all levels, but we can understand what's likely and predict how to, that they will react. Think about it this way. When you're interviewing for a job, one of the things that your prospective employer is evaluating about you and you should be evaluating about them is whether you fit into an organization. Most of the times what fit means is whether your values and your goals align with the organizations. So when we come back to the problem of understanding corporate social responsibility, because it can feel like a movable feast, it becomes more accessible if we think about values that underlie an organization's actions and put those values and those organizational values into broader community and national value priorities. Then we can begin to understand how values shape social responsibility and somehow, sometimes how organizations are constrained by their community and their national values in terms of making different kinds of actions and, and exhibiting certain types of behavior. So values, virtual, and corporate social responsibility are inherently connected. We have to begin to understand what an organization values, but also what its critical stakeholders value and how common those are. Then we can begin to figure out what CSR ought to be.